Good morning. It's Andrew with the Market Mindset. Today, we're speaking with John Hikeway from Stormcrow Capital. Now, you'll remember John from our series, Critical Thinking, which is linked here. Stormcrow Capital provides industry-specific and company-specific research, as well as consulting services to public and private companies. The reason why we're talking to John, well, John holds a PhD in physics from uh, University of Manitoba. He's got an MBA from Queens and is also the co-recipient of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, along with the other members of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Collaboration. And we want to discuss uranium prices in nuclear, the collapse of lithium prices and what that means to you, the retail investor, and review what happened to germanium and gallium after August 1st imposition of export restrictions by China, what that means as far as semiconductors and moving forward with rare earths and whatnot. Let's go catch up with John. So great to see you again, John. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Tell me, hey, how's it going? How's your day? How's the year has been? And also, we'll just slide right into uranium. <laughs> how's the how's the day been? Way too busy, um, but busy is a good thing. I mean, busy busy beats not, um, and and it's busy, Andrew, in just about every critical material that you can think of. Simply because um, there seems to be a fire lit under under various people around climate change and around trying to do something that's that's actually impactful as as opposed to just paying lip service to the problem. Yes. And actually, I think you see uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was saying something to that extent uh, a week or so ago, saying, listen, th there's too much of a political divide on some of this. We need more than yeah. just kind of talking points, uh, a, a real strong pathway. And uh, one of the interesting things, too, is right off your website and people, you can go to stormcrow.ca. Uh, around this time last year, September-ish, you did a uranium report, uh, did, which is yeah. great because you put it out to just kind of the general public. And boy, this leads a segue into uranium. How's uranium doing? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and and actually what we anticipated in that report, you know, full full admission, everything about uranium is an extrapolation. Um, there's no interpolation anymore. We don't have demand levels that you know existed five years ago. Demand is skyrocketing, supply is skyrocketing, and that means you're kind of you're trying to aim you know a curve somewhere off into the distance. That means you're probably going to be wrong in an absolute sense regarding where the numbers are going to go. I fully admit that it's it's all down to the model itself. But what we anticipate is prices are going to continue to increase. We've seen it go from 40s, you know, a year and a bit ago to 50s where it sat for a while. Now we're in the 70 range. Um, will we hit 100 before year end? I've heard people running around with their hair on fire explaining that that's going to happen. I would seriously doubt it. I don't think there's that much pressure on the on the industry at this point, especially given that we we have two sources of demand now, Andrew. We have the physical uranium trusts yes. that are buying uranium like it's an investment metal, which means there's a positive feedback loop. The more the price increases, the more people want to buy more. So we end up <laughs> yeah. with this growing demand. And we have the traditional demand from the from the nuclear companies and the power companies who need this as fuel where they will support the price if it drops because they'll buy it and stockpile it and they will try and thrift and delay their purchases if the price rises. The two kind of compete against one another, but the net impact, um, having having studied silver as a, as a technology metal in the past, and obviously it's an investment metal as well, that positive feedback loop dominates. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that we're going to see uranium go through $100 a pound next year. Um, I wouldn't doubt that we're going to see historical prices in the next two years, maybe three. And I, I wouldn't doubt that we eventually are pushing $200 a pound. Um, it may not be, you know, it may not be until towards the end of the decade, but it's an issue. But that would almost be a better case scenario than if we say, look at like 2008, where it just spiked up. Like it was almost scary in a good way, but it spiked right back yeah. down. Is well, that and, and that was and that was a that was a physical attempt to corner the market, right? Yeah. That was yeah. a, that was people that was that was non-users buying the metal, sticking it in warehouses and saying, let's see what happens. And the yeah. answer yeah. is critical materials bounce in pricing where you know you know the 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 
the price of uranium for a reactor operator is a very tiny part of their of their actual costs. It, it's less than 10% even at these prices. So they don't, would they like to get it for free? Sure, we'd all yeah. like to get everything for free, but do they do they truly, truly lie awake at night and worry about whether it's $70 or 65? The answer to that is no. Um, the problem that they're gonna have in future though is with the number of reactor builds that are happening in China, the fact that China is would love to build many hundred more reactors and, and wean themselves off of nice dirty coal if they could, they can't because they don't have access to the uranium fuel. And that creates a security concern. But that coupled to the fact that the Americans are now saying that they will become more reliant on nuclear power, the fact that one of the big topics in nuclear power today is, is small modular reactors, SMRs. An SMR is a lovely idea. You know, you, you bury this tiny little reactor under a cement plant and you use the electricity and the heat from it, you know, to power the industrial operation. Great. But the idea in an SMR is I stick it in the ground and I have and I can forget about it. It'll operate for 20 years and I don't have to do anything to it other than monitor it and enjoy the fact that it's there. That means that on day one, you are loading that reactor and it's a slightly less efficient reactor, just given the size, the, the dimensions of it. Um, you're loading that thing with all of the fuel that it's going to need for 20 years. That means higher, higher enrichment levels than a conventional reactor. And it means all the fuel demand is up front. In a, in a supply constrained market, the yeah. last thing you yeah. want to do is add a whole new market to the industry that's front end loaded in demand. Yes. And that's what we're trying to do with SMRs, which is might not be the best idea at this point. Yeah, and to put that into to scope, like I mean, you're saying like China would do hundreds, and they, I think I saw they yes. planned at least announce 150. But you're saying yes. if they could do 300, they probably would. Which if if the do. fuel, yeah, if they had the domestic uranium or the uranium was on the Belt and Road, yeah, for sure, and they could get enough to do 300, they would do it. They are they are very. They are very intently pursuing thorium reactors. Excellent. Yep. As a technology. Um, the problem, of course, with thorium is it requires, for lack of a better way of putting it, it requires a bit of a spark to mm. get it started. And that spark is typically going to be uranium. So even with a thorium reactor, you're stuck with needing some uranium initially to get everything started. And China is just not is just not blessed with large conventional deposits of uranium. No. And then we saw from COP28 uh, just last week, the U.S. announces we're going to be a nuclear powerhouse. Like we're going to lead forward, which is amazing. And that's I was great. We were, yeah, that's, that's it's like, OK, finally, this is going to happen. And we were kind of chatting before, you know, yeah. just just try to think logistically. If we started today, pick up the phone and go, let's start building about eight to 10 reactors a year till 2030. Or, or something to that extent, or, or, or you think, hold on, how many nuclear scientists, physicists, special special construction companies to build that many? Holy smokes! Yeah, I'm I'm actually I'm actually thinking, Andrew, about the number of lawyers that are going to be required oh. to sue everybody in all directions to either prevent or allow the construction yes. of these things. I mean, like, you're not going to see even if the Americans did fully commit to decarbonizing that they're going to build a bunch of nuclear reactors shut down the remaining coal and then in in sequence shut down natural gas fired systems wonderful idea impactful it actually makes a difference no doubt about it to to the climate change question and and energy security but the problem is going to be based on the track record you're not going to see a single one of these things break ground yeah. for a decade just based on the on the past history of trying to get approvals, trying to get community acceptance, trying, trying, trying. There was a there was a statement, everybody's familiar with NIMBYism. Yeah. You know, the idea, not in my backyard. There's another acronym, BANANA, that you can go look up, which is build absolutely nothing. And yeah. on and on. I mean, it's build absolutely nothing anywhere, you know, at any time. So it's, it's basically, you know, the, the United States has become a country where they want a solution to this problem, or at least a significant part of the population yeah. wants a solution to the problem but they don't actually want anybody to do anything anywhere close to them that actually has an impact on the problem 
Yeah, it so, is. It's, it's very challenging okay. to see. And I've seen it with other types of projects where it is that there isn't uh, another solution provided. It's just that we just don't want. And you think, uh, and if you're a politician, not that we're, we don't spend much time, it's it's almost better to say, I'm not going to engage in this conversation, stay in term. No. I just oh, wait. absolutely. Then, if you jump on on this, it, it's it's taking a risk to some degree. I don't see it as much of a risk. Um, the just like just take into the account the ten uranium, like the the amount of money that would bring not not only in uh, taxes for absolutely. all of those specialized, highly specialized, highly paid, uh, and construction work. I mean, it's it's huge that that would that would bring in and and as far as uh, restart an economy or get it going. It's incredible. Um, it, it's 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 actually one of my pet peeves, Andrew, is this idea that when we when we had a go at solving the ozone crisis due to chlorofluorocarbons, that was a global solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, people recognize this is a global problem. It's going to require a global solution. We need every nation to put up to basically mandate the use of less dangerous chemicals with respect to damaging the ozone layer. We we basically went at it with that attitude. We we put provisions in that said, you know, countries that are poorer, countries that are earlier in, in their stage of development, they can continue to use some of these chemicals because they're cheaper and therefore they can they can boost their their development. But developed countries like the United States and Canada and Europe and China and others basically vowed that they would they would change the the methods of manufacture, the actual chemicals used and all of the rest. And we had a solution. And here we have a global problem at a scale that I don't think we've ever had before. And the way we seem to be addressing it is, how about every country just do its best to get to zero? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, when you look at it in that context, China has coal plants all over the place because they know they have coal and they can burn it and they can rely on it to generate electricity. If they can import, you know, less polluting coal and use that, okay but if they can't they can always go back to burning brown coal and and we're done but they'd love to build nuclear plants well you know you think a country like canada would stand up and say hey we could sell you whack tons yeah. of you know of uranium if you guys gave us the offtake and by the way we can also transfer technology to you that allows you to utilize mixed fuels we can give you a reactor design that's approved ready to go that will that will utilize plutonium and uranium and thorium together and reduce the amount of uranium that you require across the life cycle of this reactor by 40 or 50 percent you know you would yeah. think that would be attractive yeah you know build jobs in canada transfer technology you know all of that sort of thing nothing we're not doing it no it's it's become such a political issue right now a hotbed issue uh on, on on a massive scale whether it's with like chips act or even canada kind of yeah. like, let's take, a, take yeah. a step back uh and it's tough because people will point out well you know why are people picking on the west for uh meeting targets whenever china is doing this and this and this you go well we're all tied together right now so right uh you, you know you, you can't just pick out one part of the argument not the other um and it is not i mean it's not an easy conversation that's for sure um, but I want to touch on one thing before we talk sure. about Canada is Kamiko. So this is interesting as well. Talk about a specific company. Uh, and of course, they've had a, a, an amazing year and they're the only producer in Canada. Yeah, yeah the only the only producer in Canada. Only major producer. Major yeah. producer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. they have bought 49% of Westinghouse in the US. So maybe kind of give us a thought. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at that and go, holy oh. smokes, you've got a full vertical integrated company here. Yeah. Kamiko actually has a really interesting technology portfolio, much deeper, much broader than, than most people understand. For example, they've got technology that allows you to produce uranium as byproduct um, from other sources of mining. Now, it costs money to deploy that. There's the potential to produce significantly more uranium, but again, it costs money to produce, you know, to deploy that technology and put in the field. When you have mines that you could expand for far less money, you know, get far more bang for your buck out of those out of those expansions or restarts. You're probably inclined to do the expansions and the restarts before you do anything brand spanking new. But but these technologies are out there. Obviously, Cameco sees a nuclear future, a nuclear renaissance 
um, and is and is preparing for it because the technology that Westinghouse had obviously is is a de facto standard around the world, and they're good at what they do. Um, you know, I I think I think it's you know it's it's a further endorsement on the window on the on the rapidly opening window that Cameco is seeing in the nuclear space, and you know hopefully society views it as they should view nuclear power, and I say this as an ex-nuclear physicist, um, they should view it as the, the lesser of many evils. Yeah. You know, it, it, yes, it, 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 is, it is one of the safest proven technologies that's out there. Yes, we should regulate the heck out of it because it can become dangerous. And yes, we should continue to monitor plants and 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 basically make them good corporate citizens and and good and good fellow residents of whatever community they're in but if we continue to approach nuclear power with the idea that it's dangerous and terrible and i don't yeah. want it anywhere you know within 10,000 kilometers of me i'm afraid the alternative is going to be a whole lot worse than building a few nuclear reactors yes and unfortunately people can go down the whole rabbit hole of uh you know, or, you know, the history of oil and gas investing in different NGOs and different environmental groups, even though they're unknowing that they're being, you know, given the information and money and funds to help Absolutely. deter it. Uh, that in and of itself is could be a, like a Netflix movie, just that whole. Oh, yeah. Uh, you yeah know. Well, without question. I yeah. mean, you know, that that's that's a part of the history that, you know, we probably don't need to rehash. I mean, there. Yeah. I don't think you're going to get that same sort of corporate no. thumb on the scale trying to trying to push nuclear down. No, but you know, overall, I, I don't think, apart from a few hand ringers and you know and and loons, I, I don't think you're going to get anybody saying they're they're absolutely you know we can do it all with solar and wind. The the, the capacity factors, which are a little more complicated than reliability, because it it basically hinges on how those technologies are actually deployed in the field. But the capacity factor of nuclear in the United States, and, and these are numbers that you can get from the Department of Energy and the Energy Information Administration in the U.S. So you can go check, anybody watching this can go check them. The capacity factor for nuclear is around 92%. Yeah. So of the available energy at the nameplate capacity of the plant in a given year, that plant is producing 92% of the energy that it should put out. Yes, everything has moments, right? You know, the, uh, some switch gear goes offline and, you know, electricity is interrupted. There's a there's a failure in a, in a turbine, you know, for an hour or two. And so you lose some output. That's, that's understood. But the capacity factor for solar is only around 25%. Yes, yeah. You know, it's, it's essentially, yes, you're only going to get half the output because it's dark at night. And the photovoltaic cells aren't producing anything. But even given that it's right half the day, you're still only producing 50% of what's available. And that ain't great. I mean, if you no. need to turn the lights on in your room, and it's dark here in Toronto today, if you need to turn the lights on in your room, 25% capacity factor is not a great bet. And wind is only around 32% because we can't make the wind blow when we need it. Yes. So, you know, if we're going to depend on those, quote unquote, cheap sources of electricity, well, then we're going to be adding a lot of expensive storage to compensate for the fact that they can't produce at specific times of day. And not only that, but we're going to have to overbuild the heck out of the solar the solar photovoltaic and the wind yeah. to generate enough energy at the good times that we have something to put in storage. Yes. So, you know, that is a hideously expensive proposition. And for those people that don't want to build anything anywhere, <laughs> now we're talking about building distributed solar farms across wide swaths of land with wind turbines stuck up in between. We're pulling power lines everywhere to try to run to these things and attach them to the to the wider grid. We're talking about a massive, massive infrastructure project as opposed to building what is essentially a really compact nuclear facility somewhere that's appropriate and stringing a line to it. 